Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Books and Books in Coral Gables. Thank you all for coming down this afternoon. Uh, as you can see from these lights and these cameras, we're live streaming the event on the internet. So a message for our internet audience at home, if at any time during the presentation you would like to purchase a copy of the book, you can just call the number on your screen. We will have the author sign it for you, and we will ship it to you wherever you are in the United States free of charge. Also, during the question and answer period, if you would like to ask Dr. Friedman a question, you could call the number on your screen or tippy-tap it away on the internet, and we will see it, and we will get that question to him during the Q&A for you. So, this afternoon, Books and Books is very happy to present Dr. John S. Friedman and his new book, The Secret Histories, Hidden Truths That Challenged the Past and Changed the World. Mr. Friedman is, Dr. Friedman, <laughs> is a journalist and documentary filmmaker. He produced the Academy Award-winning documentary Hotel Terminus, The Life and Times of Klaus Barbie, and he directed the documentary Stealing the Fire, a history of the WMD underground from the Holocaust to the present. He is a regular contributor to The Nation, among other publications, and he holds a PhD in comparative literature. In this book, he brings us a groundbreaking collection of the documents that have clarified history and altered the way we view politics and culture. It is the perfect anthology for those seeking to revisit or discover for the first time the stories that have shaped our understanding of the world. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Dr. John S. Friedman. Mark Twain wrote, when the practiced eye of the simple peasant sees the half of a frog projecting above the water, he unerringly infers the half of the frog which he does not see. To the expert student in our great science, he continued, history is a frog, half of it is submerged, but he knows it is there and he knows the shape of it. So in other words, much of what we know about history is only the tip of the iceberg. And what I'm going to talk today is about the Holocaust, the secret history of the Holocaust that most of us don't know, which has been buried for a number of years. First, I want to discuss the role of American corporations in helping the Nazis. What is generally not known is that IBM... Ford, General Motors, and Chase helped the Nazis before World War II and during World War II. Edwin Black wrote a book called IBM and the Holocaust in which he documented how IBM used its Holerith machines to provide information mainly about the Jews shortly after Hitler, Hitler became um, head of Germany in 1933. Not only did IBM help the Nazis uh, uh, put together a census of, G of the Jewish population uh, throughout Europe, particularly in Holland, but the IBM company also enabled the Germans to route trains and to keep a record of the number of people who were sent to many of the concentration camps. Now, you might say, how is this possible? Did the American government know this? What IBM did was to put up uh, or create cutouts in Switzerland and Spain and set up a German corporation that then channeled the profits to these cutouts. Did IBM headquarters know what was going on in New York? Absolutely. Um, the same applied to Ford, to General Motors, as I said, to Kodak, Chase and other companies. How are they able to do it? Again, they use so-called neutral countries as cutouts. And why did the American government allow this? Well, here and there, some American officials knew. It still is questionable whether the Secretary of State knew, whether the President knew, whether high American government officials knew. But certainly lower level officials knew. And the point is that IBM and these com uh, companies were very powerful in our country, and we needed them for the war effort. 
So here we needed Ford, we needed General Motors. At the same time, these companies were producing vehicles for the Germans. So it was a very, very delicate balancing act. Um, but the bottom line, uh, years after, is that these companies helped the Nazis and for the most part escaped without any punishment. IBM tried to cover up its role for many years until historians such as Edwin Black were able to pierce together the various parts. So not only American companies were helping uh, the Germans, but there were a number of German companies that survived the war and prospered after the war. One company in particular that I did research on is called the Degussa Company, D-E-G-U-S-S-A. Degussa, some of you might know, is known in the United States for making dental um, parts, fillings, and so forth. However, in World War II, Degussa did several things. One, it um, manufactured and distributed, or mainly distributed, Zyklon B, the gas that was used in the concentration camps. Two, it smelted the um, uranium for the Nazi atomic, bomb pro uh, Nazi atomic bomb project. And three, it took all the gold from the concentration camps that was smelted down from uh, fillings and use that gold to help the Nazis. Now, what happened to Degussa after the war? Nothing. Uh, I interviewed for my film, um, Stealing the Fire, a high-level official of Degussa. And I asked him, I said, uh, what about your activities during the war? Now, this was a man who was wanted as a um, human rights violator. He was a war criminal for things he did in Holland for the Germans. He was in the German army, in other words. He was a high official. And I asked him, I said, um, what did you do during the war? <clears throat> and he smiled. <clears throat> he said, let us pass over the war years. And then he smiled again, and I said, well, what's so funny? He said, well, after the war, we took the gold that we had smelted, and he didn't say where he'd gotten it from, obviously, but we knew as filmmakers it came from the concentration camps. And he said, we hid it. We hid the gold in the latrines so the Americans never found it. And he laughed. What was the significance of this? It meant that Nazi gold was used to fund de Goose's activities to build itself up after the war. What did it do after the war? It became one of the leading suppliers worldwide of nuclear weapons technology. Again, no one ever prosecuted Degussa. It never had to uh, pay anything for what it had done during the war, and it was just able to use millions of dollars of gold to build itself up. And then, as I said, it even established, ironically, um, companies around the world, including the United States, to manufacture dental supplies. Another part of the secret history is why did the Germans never build an atomic bomb. There have been lots of, of theories about this. Some people say that uh, scientists sabotaged uh, the research. Uh, some people say that uh, Hitler never wanted to do this. Uh, other people said that uh, resources were really given to um, V2 rockets and other weapons of, of destruction. During the filming, we were able to interview one of the last survivors of the Nazi atomic bomb project. Um, his name was von Wieseker. Um, and he was a scientist um, who had worked um, with um, uh, Heisiger, uh, Heisenberg and a number of other scientists. It was a very relatively small group making the German atomic bomb, or at least trying to make it. <clears throat> and I asked him, I said specifically, why did you not go ahead and produce an atomic bomb? You had most of the knowledge. And his answer was very simply, we did not have the financial resources. What did this mean? What was the significance of it? It meant that the German hierarchy that Hitler and his uh, people around him thought that they should put their financial resources into other activities. Thank goodness. 
because as we saw what the Germans did with the V-2 rockets, if they had the atomic bomb, clearly they would have used it. I asked von Wieseker that question. Would you have used the atomic bomb if you had it? And he unequivocally said, yes. So this is another part of the secret history that is generally unknown. Why the Germans did not have the atomic bomb, and therefore why did they not use it? Now, I want to get to the period which is um, interesting historically right after the war. I think the period from 45 to approximately 1960 in Germany is one of the most unexamined historical periods of the 20th century. What happened? Why is it unexamined? <clears throat> the forerunner of the CIA, <clears throat> then known as the CIC, <clears throat> the Central Intelligence Corps, allowed <clears throat> former Nazis to work for it. We, as the Americans, did not have the intelligence resources that the Russians did. And immediately, as you know, once World War II ended, the Russians became our main enemies. <clears throat> so what do we do? We turn to the Germans, many of them who were Nazis, high officials in the Nazi hierarchy, and we said, we want you to work for us. One of the key people the CIC hired was Klaus Barbie. Now, some of you know the name Klaus Barbie. He was in charge of the uh, Gestapo in Lyon, France, um, during the last years of the war. He deported a number of Jews. He tortured people. And he's famous for um, killing, torturing and killing the leader of the French resistance, Jean Moulin. Barbie was captured years later in the 80s um, in Bolivia, uh, where he had been hiding with his family, brought back to France, tried, found guilty, um, and he died in prison uh, some years ago. But here's the interesting thing about Barbie. He was known by American intelligence, by the Central Intelligence Corps, as a Nazi, as a, as a high Nazi official, and yet he was still hired and used by the CIC until the French wanted Barbie because they knew that he had been responsible for the murder of Jean Moulin. So the French went to the Americans and said, we know that you know where he is. At that point, the Americans became nervous because they didn't want Barbie to be questioned by the French who would, who would find out that he was really working after the war for the Americans. So what did the Americans do? They put him through what is known as the RAT line, R-A-T line. The RAT line was, there were several RAT lines. One was established by a Croatian priest named Father Draganovic, who was based in Rome. And Father Draganovic set up a, an escape route going from Europe mainly from Austria, but from other countries as well, by which Nazis could go to Italy, get passports, then they were put on ships, mainly in Genoa, and were sent to Latin America, mainly Argentina. Once they went to Argentina, then they spread out to Paraguay, Brazil, and other countries, Bolivia. So, Barbie was put on a ship, uh, he escaped to Latin America, but he wasn't the only one. There were literally thousands of Nazis who escaped this way. Now, there was, a, a, besides the Draganovic rat line, and the question, of course, comes up as an aside, did the Vatican, did the Pope know about this rat line? Did the Pope know that uh, Catholics, were, Catholic priests, were helping Nazis to escape? And so far, the evidence seems to be that the Pope didn't know. But again, this is an open question of history. This is part of the secret history that, for the moment, is still secret. So there's, on one hand, the Draganovic rat line, which is funneling a number of Nazis to freedom to Latin America, a number of Nazis who, with the help of the American intelligence corps, 
um, were finding freedom. And just as an aside, um, we spoke, uh, I spoke to um, one of these American intelligence agents for my film, Stealing the Fire, and um, he said, you know, he was smiling and laughing again. Uh, it was Christmas time. He was standing beside a Christmas tree. He said, you know, Barbie was a nice man. He was a friendly man. We used to have some beers together in a brat house. I cannot believe that he was a torturer. So it's interesting. Here was a case of the Americans really being naive about what had happened during the war. So Barbie escapes through this rat line to Latin America. And in a moment, I'll explain what happened when some of these um, Nazis reach Latin America. But the other rat line uh, was run also by priests um, indirectly connected to the Vatican who, who lived in Rome. And the other rat line um, was um, written about indirectly in Frederick Forsyth's book, The Odessa File. And it was set up by Otto Scorsini. Otto Scorsini was a rabid Nazi, and because of him, again, thousands of other Nazis were able to escape to Latin America through Italy with the help of uh, Vatican officials, or at least um, lower-level Vatican officials. What did they do once they got to Latin America? Some found jobs. Uh, Barbie prospered. Uh, he first found job in a, in a uh, sawmill helping the owner cut wood and sell wood. And then the interesting thing about Barbie was that in Bolivia, uh, in La Paz, and also in Peru, but mainly in Bolivia, he used his skills as an interrogator and torturer to help the dictatorship in Bolivia. So that he became a paid advisor to the Bolivian government, and again, I interviewed several people who were tortured by Barbie in Bolivia. Barbie was found out that he was living in Bolivia by two famous French researchers, the Klarsfels, um, who tracked him down. And for a long time, the Bolivian government did not want to release him until pressure became so great that finally he was put on a plane and sent back to France. Once he was in France, the French government hesitated because, again, this is part of the secret history. Prime Minister Francois Mitterrand had a very checkered past during the war years. And uh, he was able to escape, for example, from a uh, prisoner of war camp in the early years run by the Germans. And uh, he supposedly belonged to some right-wing groups. So the French were afraid, and this is again part of the French secret history, the French were afraid that a trial of Barbie would bring out the fact that in France there were many collaborators who assisted the Nazis. I mean, what we hear today is that the French resistance was, was very active and helped to defeat the Germans in France. Well, it's a very ambiguous story because, yes, the resistance was active, and there were a great number of heroes, but yet many French, and some might say the majority of the French population, did nothing. Why did people <coughs> collaborate? Why did they turn in their neighbors? Not just in France, but of course is, is in a number of countries, in Holland, in Germany, in Belgium, etc. Not only because of anti-Semitism, but because if you live next to a Jewish family, and they had a nice apartment, and you liked their furniture, and maybe you like the paintings they had on their walls, you might just go to the police or to the German uh, soldiers who were occupying your country and say, you know, there's that German family who lives next to us or upstairs from us, and um, uh, we thought you ought to know that, that what they're doing and where they live. And lo and behold, the Germans would come, and so would local police officials, grab the Jewish families, and in the process, leave their apartment empty. And guess who would take over that apartment? The neighbors. The neighbors who told the police and the soldiers who lived next door. So it was a question very often, not only, as I said, of anti-Semitism, but of greed, right? You wanted what your neighbors had. 
All right, to get back to Barbie for a moment. The French hesitated for a while. There was the question of whether in the Barbie trial the resistance should be brought in as well. And finally it was decided that yes, the resistance would be brought in. And one of the crimes that Barbie committed was he was responsible for the murder of scores of children from an orphanage in Isieux, Isieux, France. And there was a telegram linking him directly to this, and that telegram was one of the key reasons he was found guilty and, as I said, um, sentenced to, to um, a prison life uh, where he finally died in prison. Okay, what happened to other Germans who went to Latin America? Well, Mengele, as we know, survived. Thank you. Mengele survived until his natural death. And to this day, there are some people who say that he was killed in Brazil. Other people, not killed in Brazil, but um, died in Brazil. Other people say he died in Paraguay. But he escaped. He never was punished. Eichmann. Eichmann was caught by the Israelis, by the Mossad, in 1960. I interviewed one of the Mossad members years later, a very short, strong man, who said, yes, he bundled Eichmann into a car. And then, as we know, Eichmann was sent to Israel, and there was the famous trial uh, that Hannah Arendt and others have written about. But the question comes up in the secret history, what happened to all the other Nazis? Why were they never prosecuted? Why were they never found? Why did the Israelis never go after them as well? And I don't know if anybody here wants to suggest an answer, but um, I think the answer has been uh, clear, although it's not really generally known, that the Israelis at the time needed the votes of the Latin American countries in the UN. And when the Israelis kidnapped Eichmann from Argentina, there was a lot of hostility to this. People said, you have no right. How can you take away one of our citizens? And the Israelis were reluctant to antagonize a number of Latin American countries by kidnapping other Nazis and ex-Nazis. Now, when I researched in Latin America what happened to the Nazis, I was struck by several things. One, that in every major Latin American city, uh, city, there was a German club where Germans would go and, and eat and socialize and drink. Well, guess what? After the war, you didn't have Jews going to these clubs. Who was, uh, who was a member of the clubs? They were usually Nazis, ex-Nazis. So all you had to do, if you were an investigator, looking for Nazis in Latin America, all you had to do was to go to one of these clubs, look at the membership list, and say, I recognize some of these names. Many of the Nazis who were hiding in Latin America corresponded with families back in Germany. Mengele, for example, corresponded with his family who owned a factory in Germany. Um, it was no secret that they wrote letters um, and corresponded. Some traveled. Supposedly, Barbie even came to the United States to New Orleans once. So, if you were interested in tracking down Nazis, it was relatively easy to do in Latin America uh, during the 60s in particular, 60s and early 70s, before many of them started dying through old age, etc. Now, in Paraguay, there was a um, city that um, a number of Nazis inhabited um, called uh, New Germany in, in, in translation. Um, there was a large Nazi population, a German population in Bolivia, uh, in Peru, in Argentina. Argentina, by the way, again, this is part of the secret history, um, was friendly to the Germans before the war, during the war, and after the war. As a matter of fact, Perón said, you can send us your, your Germans, uh, we will gladly welcome them. Um, so, 
a number of Nazis survived in Latin America and uh, prospered, and nobody was hunting them. Now, I met a man, <clears throat> a Jewish businessman, as a matter of fact, he was just seemingly an ordinary clothing manufacturer who lived in New York, and um, we were interviewing him uh, for a film, and then towards the end of the interview, he said, John, I'll tell you something. I had brought up this question of why no Nazis had been captured, particularly besides Eichmann, really. He said, a few of us did things on our own. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, I would, for example, hire a private plane and go to um, Central America, and um, we would take care of the people we thought were guilty. In other words, there were private assassination attempts going on. Um, again, it wasn't that hard to find out who some of these Nazis were, and um, whether this man was, was making up a story or not, I don't know. But the point is that um, there were individuals who were taking care of what they thought was justice. Now, um, there are a number of other uh, questions that have come up. Uh, one of them is, uh, who else was hired by the Americans after the war? One of the key people was Reinhard Galen. Who was he? Reinhard Galen had been one of the top intelligence officers for the Nazis. As I said, we needed Nazi officials to fill us in about what was happening in the Soviet Union, because after the war ended, the Germans knew more about the Russians than the Allies did. And we said, rather than having these people go to the Russians, who are hiring many of them, we need them. We want them. So we hired Reinhard Galen, who set up what was known as the Galen Organization. Galen, by the way, lived a number of years here in Florida. The Galen Organization provided the main intelligence information for many years about the Russians. So here we had a top Nazi working for our intelligence organization. Um, did anyone care? Not really. Again, what was the justification? The justification was the Cold War. What else happened after the war? Operation Paperclip. What was Operation Paperclip? Operation Paperclip was a program whereby thousands, at least a thousand, of Nazi scientists were brought over to the United States to help, particularly in the space program. And who was one of the leading scientists who did this? Werner von Braun. Von Braun brought with him a number of his colleagues who had worked on the V2 project. Now, this was clearly known, as was the Galen organization, to the highest levels of the American government. Nobody cared. What, what is the moral? I mean, if there's a moral to all this, if there's a historical theme to all this, what is it? It's that morality really doesn't matter that what matters is a real politic, what matters is the uh, exigency of the moment, and that everything must be done, that the means justify the ends. So the uh, rocket scientists uh, who were housed all over, uh, some were housed in Long Island um, and the rest of the country, um, became some of the leading space scientists now, you might say, well, come on, Friedman, uh, wasn't it important to, to defeat the Russians or at least to know what they were doing and, and have better weapons? Uh, wasn't it important that we built up our space program? Absolutely. But the question is, who was used and what was the end? Um, all right, so we brought over a, a, and used a number of ex-Nazis um, for intelligence, for scientific purposes. Um, and, and by the way, this, this is part of the secret history too, uh, the Germans developed biological weapons, chemical weapons, um, and um, 
a num some of these scientists also were brought over. In other words, there was blowback. And um, we've seen the blowback in Afghanistan um, of how we helped um, <clears throat> insurgents against the Russians. And then when the Russians left, the insurgents, the Al-Qaeda insurgents turned against us. So blowback is a very tricky thing. Now, you might say, how did the Germans in the United States blow back against the United States? It's been documented, and again, uh, this is generally unknown, that a number of right-wing causes in communities of not only Germans, <coughs> but of um, anti-communist who had come to this country after the war, who settled in places like Chicago, <coughs> people from Eastern Europe, uh, who settled in places like Chicago and Cleveland, etc., um, became very active in right-wing American politics. They set up organizations, they supported right-wing candidates, and these were people who we helped and brought over, um, not necessarily be for their expertise, but just because they were able to, to use the um, immigration process. Now, let me pause for a minute. Are there any questions at this point? Does anybody have a question? Because I've covered a lot of ground, and, and I don't want to go too fast over this. OK. Well, Dr. Friedman, yeah. I do have a, a quick question. You mentioned sure. uh, the fact that uh, Werner von Braun was uh, the high-level person in the American space program. That must have been known to the general public. Was there, pu was there negative public opinion about having Werner von Braun as a part of NASA, or did, or like you said, where we caught up in the space race and people were willing to look the other way? <clears throat> the fact that Werner von Braun came over here was generally not publicized. It only became known slowly over the years. Um, in the beginning, it was generally not known. And most of this information really has just come out in the last few decades. The US government was not publicizing the fact that we had hired these people to help us because clearly there's going to be a negative reaction. Um, and certainly the, the situation with Reinhard Galen was, was not known at all. Uh, the situation of hiring Barbie was certainly not known. Um, and if it had been known, the question is, would people have, have cared? Well, in the Cold War, in the, in the McCarthy years of the 50s, the prevailing attitude in the United States was, we have to do everything we can to stop the Russians. Um, and don't forget that the Holocaust itself really did not come into public consciousness until the early 60s. I interviewed Elie Wiesel for the Paris Review, for example. And Elie Wiesel, as you know, in his book Night, was one of the first people to draw attention to the Holocaust. And um, slowly the Holocaust has gotten more and more attention where today there are Holocaust museums in a number of cities and, and people are interested in Holocaust films and books, etc. Um, but for a long time, people didn't want to talk about the Holocaust, particularly uh, in Germany. It, not only American Jews. <clears throat> I know a number of American Jews who were survivors and their children were never told what happened to them. Uh, they never wanted to talk about it, and their children would press them, and their parents would say, we don't want to talk about it. It's, it's, it's uh, verboten, or, or it's too painful. Not only American Jews, but I've also talked to the children of Nazis. And um, when they pressed their parents, when they found out the truth, sometimes not from their parents, but through other means, it shattered their relationships with their parents. I know I met one woman, for example, <clears throat> whose father had been head of a slave labor camp. And when she pressed her father for the truth and <clears throat> he told her, she never spoke to him again. And um, this is something also that is generally not known, <clears throat> that the generation of Germans who were too young to have participated in World War II, when they found out what had happened, <clears throat> turned against that generation. They turned against their, their parents. Um, so that in Germany today, you really have two groups of people. You have the people who were part of the war, 
who are active in the war, and then you have the group who uh, came of age much later. And the group that was active in the war <clears throat> really deny everything. I mean, I've, I've spoken to a number of Germans, high officials and others, and I said, what did you do during the war? And almost to a person, you know what their answer was? Nothing. Or I, you know, was an ordinary soldier. Did you know about the concentration camps? Oh, no. Well, that also surprised me. And again, that's part of the secret history. Because survivors have told me, even people who were guards at the concentration camps, that the smoke, the odor of burning bodies from the camps disseminated from many miles around so that you could not avoid knowing if you lived anywhere near a camp what was going on. In addition, if you lived anywhere near the railroads, <clears throat> you saw a number of um, people being taken away on boxcars. Even if your neighbor, if you lived nowhere near a camp, if you lived nowhere near a railroad, you knew that your neighbors were being taken away in the middle of the night to some unknown destination and they never returned, what did you think was happening to them? So the Germans knew. Of course they knew what was going on. And even to this day, um, when I visited Dachau, I was struck by the fact that there is a Dachau Strasse that goes right by the camp, and there is a sign saying uh, to the, the camp, and right below the sign is another sign that says McDonald's. So that, that is the Germany of today. Uh, the interesting thing is that Germany, as I said, still has not come to terms with its past. It's beginning to. It's trying to. But part of the secret history is that a number of German researchers are slowly beginning to try to figure out what really was done um, during the war. Now, another whole issue is the question of trials. Who was tried? Who was not tried? Um, why were the people who were not tried not tried? After the war, uh, with the Americans and the Allies in charge of certain zones and sectors, the Russians in charge of other zones and sectors, uh, we know, of course, about the Nuremberg trials, which tried a relatively small number of Germans, particularly a few of the very high officials. What about the others? Well, most of the German judges who retained their positions in the judicial system after the war had been Nazis. Many of the local elected officials had been Nazis. Why did we permit this? Because there was no one else, right? That these people had the expertise, we needed them, we wanted the country to be rebuilt, so we allowed them to come back. Also, um, you had um, several people who were in charge of Germany uh, after the war, and particularly the High Commissioner for Germany, and they said, we're not going to try the Nazis. This was about 1950, 1951. They said, um, we're not going to try the Nazis anymore because this is ca causing ill feeling in Germany and we want the Germans to support the United States and the Allies. And if we try these people, it's just going to cause hostility against us. So various trials, various people that were being held in prison were released. Um, and... There were no trials after roughly 51. Yeah, there were a few. There was a famous trial in 1963. Um, but for the most part, um, Germans who had participated in the war got off. Uh, they might have served short prison terms and then they uh, were released. Now, one of the interesting things uh, also, another secret history, and I talk about some of these secret histories, particularly about IBM, in my book, uh, The Secret Histories, Hidden Truths That Challenge the Past and Change the World. Um, one of the other secret histories is, why did ordinary Germans become mass murderers? You have a neighbor, as I said. He's friendly to you. Um, he seems like a decent guy. Why is it that 
suddenly overnight he becomes a mass murderer. Now, this is not just true in Germany. This has been true in other genocides. It was true in Rwanda. It was true in Cambodia. And the question uh, is, what makes men become mass murderers? And um, I am the executive producer of a new film called Radical Evil, which uh, focuses uh, on a group of uh, German policemen from Hamburg um, who were sent to the Ukraine. Um, and in the Ukraine, they, become, they became mass killers. And why did this happen? What, what is it that, that changes men overnight? Well, a number of psychologists and, and psychiatrists and historians have looked at this. Robert Lifton has looked at this in the, in the idea of doubling, whereby a man can commit mass murder during the day and then go home at night and play with his children. In other words, he has really two personalities. What happened to these um, ordinary men um, is that, first of all, peer pressure, that their comrades were doing this, and therefore they felt that they could do it. Second of all, um, they were challenged. What, what's the matter? Are you a coward? Are you afraid? Um, they were put on the spot. The interesting thing is that when German soldiers refused, and again, it's not just um, some of these killers in the Ukraine, but throughout the German army and throughout the concentration camps, there were a handful of soldiers who said, no, we are not going to do this. And you know what happened to them? No, almost nothing. That's the amazing thing. That yeah, they, they weren't shot, they really weren't punished, they were just kind of shunted aside. They weren't going to get promotions, they weren't going to be praised, but they really were not going to be punished. And this is one of the, the um, again, one of the parts of the secret history uh, of World War II that has not been looked at. And that is, if this is the case, why did more Germans refuse? Refuse to participate? And part of it has to do with, with again, the German mentality, uh, that there was anti-Semitism in Germany, that uh, Germans, I don't want to generalize, but for the most part, uh, Germans kind of went along with the system. It was part of the German character. Um, so that other people refused. Um, uh, we've seen it in other countries. The Italians often refused. Um, the Danes certainly refused. Um, but... Uh, the Germans didn't. All right, before I continue, does anybody have a question at this point? About Latin America, about Europe, about what happened to the Nazis once, once they uh, escaped? My, the, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah. That has been bothering me for a long time, and that is what the, the, there are many survivors, Holocaust survivors, who went, also went to Latin America. And they didn't seem to do anything, or they didn't apparently. There were some actions done and funded by American Jews to look for, for Germans. And these were uh, private uh, sort of things that were not uh, sanctioned by anybody. Uh, but the, the, Jew, the survivors really didn't try to do very much. Maybe they wanted to put it behind them. But I can't believe that when they've lost most of their families in most instances. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Uh, why did these survivors in Latin America uh, not do anything? Um, it's interesting. Um, they did things in very small ways. For instance, um, I knew of a Jewish bookstore owner um, in Bolivia who... Um, when Barbie came into his bookstore, said, I won't serve you. Please leave. Um, but that's a small gesture. Excuse me, your question goes to the larger issue of why did Jews not inform the officials about the Nazis? Well, the, the first um, answer is, whom were they going to tell? What were they going to do with this information? They clearly were not going to go to Latin American officials because Latin American officials um, were supporting 
these Nazis in many cases. In other words, these were dictators and they had the same mentality. And as I said, in the case of Barbie and other Germans, the uh, Latin American leaders were using the Germans for their own uh, needs. That's number one. Number two, um, were they going to go to the Israelis? Well, I explained what the Israeli position was, and it was difficult. Um, the Israelis were kind of caught in a bind. Um, number three, were they going to go to the Americans? No, the Americans were not going to go into Latin America and, and uh, in those days, uh, kidnap or kill ex-Nazis. Uh, so really, what was the mechanism? Now, you had people like Simon Wiesenthal who were hunting Nazis. You had the Klarsfelds. Um, but obviously, these were people in Europe. They weren't people in Latin America. The third um, reason is there just weren't that many Jews in these countries. And they wanted to put the war years behind them. Um, uh, it, it would have been a cause celebre. It would have been a very difficult thing to say that this high official or this prosperous businessman is really an ex-Nazi. Um, now, it's not as if these ex-Nazis were using their real names. Um, and you had to then explain that he, he really is a Nazi. Well, somebody might say, whoever that somebody is who was interested, some government official from abroad, how do we know he is who he is? How do we prove this? So um, if you're going to be an informer, the fourth question is, what was going to happen to you as an informer? Were you going to be killed by some of these Nazi sympathizers? So, so really, having been a survivor, having been a victim, you just wanted to live your life and, and have a happy life for, for your children and, and not start uh, causing a lot of, of trouble for yourself and your family. Does that answer your question? Well, not com it, it, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's a form of answer. I'm not sure that I'm totally satisfied with the answer, but I don't have any other suggestions. Yeah, um, look, I, I would also raise the question of why didn't Jews, it gets to the broader question of why didn't Jews in the United States during the war really come out more strongly, strongly about what was happening in Europe? And part of the reason for that is that a number of people in Jewish organizations, first of all, um, did we know? Did, uh, I'm a Jew myself, obviously. Did the Jewish community know what was happening? Not completely but a number of Jews did and put pressure on the government. And what did the government do? Did Roosevelt bomb the concentration camps, the rail lines in the concentration camps? No. Why didn't he? Because he said it's more important to defeat the Germans. Um, a number of Jews, of course, helped with relief organizations, but um, people didn't know. They were ignorant. They were afraid. Um, I'm, I mean, if you think of, of some recent events in this country, what people do and don't do, for the most part, there's a reluctance to speak out. There's a reluctance to get involved. Um, and so I think it's perfectly understandable why Jews in Latin America did not say, you know, I think that man's an ex-Nazi or a Nazi. Um, what do you do? That, that's really the question. And any other questions from anybody? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, referring to the issue of trying to get Germans to kill is it known whether they were actually bribed, people were bribed, depending on how many Jews a, a certain soldier could kill? When you were saying getting volunteers, you were talking about getting volunteers to kill. Is it, a, you know, do, do we know whether they were actually bribed? No, get them no. See, see, see that's, that's, that's one of the great um, ironies in a sense, that, that they did what they did without necessarily getting any extra benefits. Yeah, they might have gotten a little more schnapps, right, for that evening. Um, but they weren't given special privileges, particularly. Um, if they didn't do some of these things, um, or if they openly protested, now I know this contradicts what I said a few minutes ago, um, they were often sent to the Russian front. But again, there was a small group who uh, protested and they weren't sent to the Russian front. Uh, in other words, whether you were sent to the Russian front or not was another whole issue. Um, if you were considered a traitor or whatever, or a communist or questionable, whatever. Um, but no, they weren't bribed, they weren't given special benefits, and um, 
They became mass killers, as I said, because of um, the group mentality, because um, they were afraid to say no. And um, after a while, and again, this is part of the secret histories, that if you start killing, it becomes almost, it feeds on itself. It, it becomes a, a kind of um, a high. And, and um, you, you say to yourself, well, I've killed one. What's, what's the crime if I kill another? Um, and so after a while, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, yes, please go ahead. The prevailing mood of anti-Semitism that existed in Europe, in France, in Germany, and various other areas. These soldiers were brought up in homes where they were taught anti-Semitism. So it wasn't a big step to go from their teaching from their school teachers, parents, grandparents, to kill. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a very valid point, that the prevailing anti-Semitism, not only in Germany, I mean, you had terrible anti-Semitism in Austria, in Poland, in the Ukraine, etc., which went back hundreds of years, right? And so if, if you killed a Jew, um, you were killing somebody who was not considered a human being. He was, he was the other. We know the concept of the other, that uh, this is somebody who is not like you. And, and if you kill somebody who's not like you, well, maybe it's not such a terrible crime. Um, so there are a whole no number of reasons um, why ordinary Germans became mass murderers. So we see in some of the comics, for example, if we're familiar with any of the comics of that era, when you look at the pictures that kids used to draw in some of those books from the 30s, like, 19, in the late 30s, for example, if you're familiar with some of those comments. Yes, it was comments. very, very strong anti-Semitism. Now, I want to bring out one other thing that I think is important, bringing everything up to the present, because I'm not only talking about the secret history of the past, I'm talking about the secret history of today that we just don't know about. Um, a couple of years ago, um, in Munich, a stash of about 1,500 works of art many of them considered so-called degenerate art by the Nazis, was found in the apartment of a man named Cornelius Gerlitt, whose father had been a very prominent um, Nazi art collector. For two years, the German officials kept this secret. It only came out recently, some months ago, when a German magazine broke the story. What is happening today is that a commission has been set up to investigate the history of this art because many of the works belong to Jews. And these works were stolen from them or at least purchased through force at very, very cheap prices because the, the uh, people who sold the works had no choice. They needed the money and, and, and the uh, Nazis were forcing them to sell the works of art. I bring this up. Because in Germany today, again, the past, um, who was it, Orwell, who said that um, he who controls the past controls the present. The past has become something that is controlling the present. That German authorities are saying, well, maybe some of the works might have to be returned, but maybe the bulk, <coughs> excuse me, uh, won't be returned. Maybe many of these works really are legitimate. They belong to Gerlitt himself. Um, so that this is an ongoing issue. The past in Germany is present today. And that much of the secret history of the past still rebounds. And so this question of the hidden art, of the stolen Nazi art, um, is going to perplex um, historians and art critics um, for maybe decades to come, um, that the survivors, the heirs, are saying, look, this was stolen from our ancestors. It belongs to us. And there's a question of the law. Um, well, does the person who later bought the art and maybe didn't know it was stolen, 
Uh, is it right to make that person give back the art? There are a number of thorny issues, but I'm saying all of this really gets back to the war. Are there other questions that anybody has about any of this? Because my, my point today, what I'm trying to make, is that whether it's the psychology of Germans then and now, the psychology of Jewish survivors who um, were reluctant to talk about the Holocaust for many years, um, and as you bring out in your question, maybe some of whom um, knew about Germans in Latin America and didn't do anything. Um, I don't want to blame them in any way. I mean, I, I never want to blame a survivor, but the, these are historical questions. Why the Germans um, were so active, why, why they didn't hesitate in the mass killings, um, why the Americans um, hired Germans after the war, why Vatican officials helped these Germans to go to Latin America, why Latin American dictators hired them and protected them, why they were never captured after the war. I mean, the questions just go on and on, and a question leads to other questions. We have time for one last question from this gentleman here. Sure, please uh, go ahead. Uh, what, uh, what, what became uh, of money allegedly sent to countries like uh, Argentina and Brazil uh, and, and used there? Uh, when you say money sent, uh, sent by whom? Sent, sent by, by, by Nazis in uh, Europe. It was just used to support Nazis. I mean, there was, look, there, there was so-called uh, secret organizations. And, and this, as I said in the Odessa file and other stories, um, there were, I, I wanted to bring this out. It's a good, good question. That in my research, I found that the Nazis were in touch with each other. So that Barbie was in touch with Eichmann. And they were in touch with other Nazis. It's not as if they were operating independently. And so when money was sent to a Nazi, it was sent for his benefit. Uh, when organizations helped Nazis in Latin America, it was for the benefit of the Nazis. So mainly it was to help individuals and small groups. I've heard that the, that, uh, that, that parts of, of Mercedes Benz were used uh, to, you know, the system to, to send monies. Uh, that the Mercedes-Benz Corporation helped Nazis in Latin America? Um, it's a possibility. Again, that's part of the secret history that hasn't come out. That German firms, what German firms did after the war is generally not understood. As I talked about the Degusa company early on in my talk, um, Degusa was investigated, but you could investigate um, a number of companies. I investigated Bertelsmann for the Nation magazine, and Bertelsmann denied that it had helped the Germans in propaganda during the war, but it turned out that Bertelsmann did help the Germans by producing certain books and, and uh, comic books, etc. And here Bertelsmann, as we know, is one of the major publishers in the world. So I think to find out more about the secret histories, you could look at almost every major German company and say, what did you do during the war? Dr. Friedman. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, folks, we have the secret histories for sale at the counter, as well as one of Dr. Friedman's previous titles, Out of the Blue. Uh, for the Internet audience at home, a reminder, there's still time to call and purchase a copy of the book, and we'll get it signed and shipped to you. Also, our uh, live-streamed events are archived, so you could go to the Books and Books website, go to the link for the live streaming, and um, any presentation that's been broadcast from here, will be saved there for you to watch at your convenience. And for those of you here in the house, that was a fascinating talk. Please give Dr. Friedman another hand. Thanks very much. All right. <laughs>